if um, I could be, ask you to welcome Dorothy Keith. She's the Clinical Ambassador of Transforming Health here in South Australia. And Dorothy is also the um, Professor of Cancer Medicine at the University of Adelaide and a Senior Medical Oncologist at Royal Adelaide Hospital Cancer Centre. So if everything goes according to plan, <coughs> I've done that. Um, we will get that set up. It's amazing how nervous you can be when everyone's watching you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> you did that beautifully and thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak at this afternoon. And, and also, I have to say, I'm really um, touched that the university and these groups have come together to actually put on a research session about transforming health. It demonstrates that transforming health resonates with everybody, that everyone realises we're really doing this and that we're actually actively working out how to um, enhance it. You've got to enhance it with a microphone. Enhance it with a microphone. Um, everyone, uh, you know, we, we, it will be made better by all the steps that everybody takes together. So um, I'm really thrilled about that. somehow or other, managed to get the microphone into a position where it works. No? There we are. Set? Excellent. Okay. So transforming health, the journey to change, innovation and continuous quality. I think pretty much everybody now understands why we're undergoing this journey. Uh, we have an ageing infrastructure, we have old-fashioned, outdated models of care, and we are no longer able to actually deal with the demands that are put on our system. Um, the way our health system is configured currently doesn't actually produce the best outcomes all the time. Everybody goes to work every day striving to do their best to make sure that we do deliver the best outcome for our patients, but the system is not set up to support that anymore and we don't always achieve it. So what we need is a dynamic and flexible health system um, that actually responds to changing health needs. Chronic diseases and longer term conditions are a much more important part of healthcare than, than is um, it's given credit for. There are ongoing advances in medical science, treatment and technology, and unfortunately, there are always limits to the ability to grow funding. So we had a look at uh, what was happening in South Australia compared with other areas in Australia and around the world and we showed that we did some, some things very well in certain places and at certain times but that we didn't have consistency across the system. Uh, we have a varying length of stay in hospital for the same people with the same conditions which does seem a bit ridiculous. Uh, much more sadly than that we have different mortality rates for similar populations with similar interventions and that's not acceptable um, and we have differences in the numbers of procedures and treatments and tests that are done in various places and actually in any system like this however complex it is much of it will be predictable able to be predicted and therefore you could in fact um, streamline some of what we do now we know that uh, transforming health has to address the whole system to achieve success and really and I was talking about this today at um, another forum that transforming health that we are doing now is really transforming health part one it's just that you can't call it part one because that doesn't sound very sort of you know exciting um, but part one is let's concentrate where we spend all the money and where all the demonstrated issues are as in the public metropolitan hospitals but stage two is let's make it statewide so it really does meaningfully um, impact in country and also in primary care and community. And stage, I'm beginning to talk about stage three now because you know I can see a long-term future for this, um, where we look at the, other, the things that are not traditionally under the health budget but are actually really important, such as the social determinants of health and the ends of, of life, really. And so there's a whole lot of stuff that has to be done as well. But, but we have to start somewhere and we have to start where we can have the biggest impact and that is where we're starting now. And we obviously want to be delivering safe, effective, patient-centred, accessible, efficient and equitable care. And I say, you know, what we're looking for in health reform is it's got to be clinician-led, patient-centred, data-driven, evidence-based, evidence-based and data-driven and underpinned by an electronic health record and then we have South Australia. 
And what we have to get to is from where we are now to that sort of um, excellence. So overall, we've agreed that we need better treatment options, better specialisation, better integration and better processes, and implementing the standards that have been set for South Australia by the clinical advisory groups will change how and where services are delivered. And this is the bit where it gets difficult. Everybody agrees that we need to reform healthcare, but could you please not do it to the bit of healthcare that I'm involved in, because that would be a bit distressful. And so we have to get over that, that bit of it. Everybody is going to be touched by this, but it's going to be better for the system and for the patients, more importantly. So we identified about 75 different initiatives that we needed to undertake, um, and 50 have been selected for implementation up front to address um, these uh, problems that we have, to so improve our quality, reduce inequities, and um, generally make the system more efficient. And this will enable us to meet the quality clinical standards of care. So now um, we've progressed post the uh, cabinet approval of the Transforming Health Program to implementation and uh, a new ministerial clinical advisory group has been set up which I chair and the, um, the group is overseeing the clinical work on the models of care to underpin the whole of the transformation process and has a very influential position within the governance of Transforming Health because we set the models of care and then they are implemented by the LHNs. The current projects that we've started with are stroke, acute coronary syndrome, rehabilitation, orthogeriatrics, fractured nicophema, uh, and the location of the PTSD Centre of Excellence and the location of the Doorhouse Palliative Care Service. So those are the first pieces of work, but there are another 45 or so to go. We provide clinical leadership and guide the way um, the program's implemented, we're recommending the models of care and it's all about being clinician-led and quality-focused. Um, we have 28 uh, senior members from across SA Health, but we realise that actually you can't just do this with SA Health, even though it is an SA Health operational business activity, but we've included uh, Professor Alex Brown, who heads the Aboriginal um, theme at SAMRI, because we need to have the Aboriginal voice in the room at all times to, to keep us on track. And we have Michael Cousins, who's the CEO of the Health Consumer Alliance, because exactly the same way we need to have the consumers in the room to keep us on track. And that's uh, been a very valuable addition to those, um, those meetings. One of the things that happens after you start, uh, after we got cabinet approval, then you have to actually start the work rolling and actually do all the things that need to be done. And we don't have the resources and uh, numbers of people and skills to actually do it all on our own. So we're at the moment out um, uh, seeking an implementation partner who will come in and stand beside us to enable us to do all of this work and teach us how to go on doing this work ourselves so that when they leave, we can actually sustain ongoing change and transformation. Um, but that takes a few months to get right because first of all you have to define what you want and then you have to go out to the market and assess whether what's being offered is appropriate and so there's there could be a gap and we don't want a gap because we don't want the momentum of transforming health to fail so we have in, uh, employed McKinsey and Co to help working with us on the winter demand strategy because basically if we can't stop the ramping in the hospitals this winter we're going to lose credibility over whether we're able to actually implement these changes. So at the moment we're working on um, the emergency pathway, the surgical pathway, mental health pathway, respiratory pathway, training some of our senior clinical leaders, although we need to do a lot more work training right the way through our staff, and we've just completed the top-down delivery planning looking at all of the different initiatives that have to be done and who is going to be responsible for doing them. And once that's locked into place and the time at which they have to be done, then you can start the bottom-up planning, which is done by the whole workforce in order to actually deliver. And, and, and the idea is that the two meet in the middle and actually achieve what we need to achieve. So clearly, um, this is a system-wide approach. Um, there are huge obstacles that could actually stop us from reforming. Um, they would be things like doing it in a piecemeal manner and lack of engagement and consultation. I have to say, I'm not sure there's any such thing as a completely successful communication and consultation strategy, but we are trying extraordinarily hard. 
I will meet with anyone who wants to meet with me, talk about anything they want to talk about in transforming health, go anywhere, uh, anytime, uh, because that's, that's the role. But, and we have lots of different communications that cascade out. And I was asked last night by the junior doctors um, uh, why they weren't kept informed about transforming health. And I said to them, well, part of it is probably that you don't read your health emails. And, you know, did you watch the video blog? What video blog? Okay, you need to read the emails that come out from transforming health or you're not allowed to whinge that you weren't consulted with. But I mean, we, do, we just have to keep getting better and better. We're about to um, consider launching ourselves into Twitter and Facebook because, you know, there are just some people who, who now just don't do email. Um, and any, and uh, so that's quite fun. But of course, organisational resistance is a huge challenge and we are trying whatever we can do to get people to engage in this in a meaningful way. And of course, there are there are people that we are not going to be able to reach who have become what I describe as terminally cynical and, and there's no point actually spending any of our time on them. But we can spend time on those who are just sort of standing back and being a bit silent, those who are sort of muttering amongst themselves but not actually doing anything. We, those people are, you know, engageable and we need to engage those. Now, most transformations fail. This is a great, you know, cheering way to start the day. Um, <laughs> But they basically fail because there are, we don't support the change systemically enough, that, that we don't put in place the sufficient resources or budget, um, management behaviour doesn't change, or employees are too resistant. So the reason this one's going to work is that we have actually recognised this ahead of time, put in to our um, implementation plans ways of actually overcoming this. So we, we've acknowledged that in, in, the, in the old days, what would have happened would be that the department would have said, right, you need to change all these things. We're going to cut your budget, off you go. Well, I've realised that that doesn't work, that you have to drive it on, on clinical quality, that you have to overcome these um, barriers and that it will only work if you invest in doing that. And so there is investment for the first time ever in actually changing the system, which is, which is pretty good. Um, so obviously there's a lot of uh, mindset and behaviour shifts uh, so that we develop the right culture and approach to health service delivery, um, that we train our workforce in patient-centred care um, and of course we know that we're all here to work for our patients but actually we don't live that dream as it were on a daily basis and the culture doesn't live that dream so we need to do that and we need to work together to um, produce the best outcome. So this is, this is one of the great challenging slides, which you don't have to read in great detail, but it basically lists on one side what we do now, and what we do now is not always patient-centred with the best interests of the whole system and the whole population in mind. Um, we, we're tribal, we worry about our patients, our unit, our hospital, our money. We don't think about the whole system. And so we're, we're challenging ourselves to change from the left-hand side to the right-hand side and do things that are actually about best outcomes for patients. So um, there are lots of things that are really important in um, actually making this work. Uh, it needs to be owned by the people, it needs to be documented and it needs to be tracked and I think a lot of this is where the, it, it, we start getting into this evaluation research um, space where we haven't traditionally done any of this. And we need to do it, to evaluate it, and to publish it. Because we need to be demonstrating whether transforming health is a raging success or whether it has issues. Um, and we absolutely need to get things to happen. So um, I'm a great one for, OK, this is what we want to do. Let's give it a try and see if we can make it work, rather than I need more clarity about that before I can take step one. And then you go and get the more clarity, and then I need more clarity about something in here before I can even get onto the page. And in the end, you, you've sort of reduced it to a point where you can't get out of bed in the morning, and nothing ever gets changed. So, so we are going to, you know, it doesn't have to be 100% perfect before we actually start something. Let's test it. Let's find out what goes right and wrong and learn and move on. And let's be part of the solutions, not um, part of the problems. And actually, one of my favourite bits, of course, is celebrating the success. Any excuse for a party, in my view. Um, and so we need to just keep doing this and keep reminding ourselves, actually, we're on, we're on this journey together to make things better. So let's celebrate every little milestone of making things better for our population. 
So clearly transforming health is a unique opportunity. I cannot personally believe my luck that I was offered the job that I've been offered. What a fantastic opportunity to actually take everything that I might have learned in my entire career and use it in a focused way on an issue that everybody else wants to get involved in. And, and, and look, at you know, this is fantastic. Um, moving away from traditional design and operation, aiming for cutting edge, innovative thinking and research, faster change and consistently better outcomes. Difficult to argue with that. And it's a rare opportunity to revolutionise every part of our system. Turn over every stone, which is always alarming in health. You turn over a stone you wish you hadn't because there's something <laughs> underneath there that isn't quite right. Let's turn them all over and let's get them all aligned and working towards best outcomes for our patients. So uh, we're going to use you know, a great excuse for innovation, technology, um, staff and resourcing, new models of care to change the way we deliver our care and new models of care which basically demonstrate what we're doing is the right thing to do. Better response to patient needs. For example, one of the things we're looking at in, in surgery is to increase the number of procedures done as day and extended day um, surgical procedures. Now, it's known that you can do about 80% sometime. Actually, in, in the UK, I think their target's 90% of all surgery is day case. In Adelaide, we, make, we hit the marvellous total of, I think, about 65% of day case. Um, that leaves a gap of 25% of operations which are done with an overnight stay, taking up a bed, that we could probably use for somebody else uh, who might need to be in it if we actually just got the job done. And so what we've done is develop the list of um, surgical procedures that can be done as day cases and extended day cases and actually start asking people to do that. You know, and then you get all the excuses when we first suggested um, that we change um, gallbladder surgery to day case. Well, how about we wait till we've run through all the people on the waiting list now so that they don't have to know there's a change and then we'll think about it. Well, how about we write them a letter and say, guess what? Modern practice is that you have your surgeries a day case. You're going to have your surgeries a day case. It, it saved something like 10 beds at the Royal Adelaide Hospital overnight. And those 10 beds are actually really important, not, not at, to close them at the Royal Adelaide Hospital, but to actually fill them with people from the emergency department who can't get into them fast enough. So, so that all worked out. So basically, every single piece of the pathway has to be looked at. Orthogeriatrics, there's a very good um, uh, model for how you should manage uh, fractured neck of femur. We know about it, everyone agrees with it, we should do it, we just don't do it. So this is another piece of the work that we're working towards. Um, and basically looking at um, everything we do, which does have um, implications for our workforce. And so we do have to have a way of supporting the workforce to adapt to new ways of working, to the new models of care and a new, the new approach to healthcare delivery. And, and we do realise this is one of those big problems for the workforce. We have a workforce strategy committee that's working through, who would have thought we didn't have a strategy for health workforce? We don't. What we have is we have a historical model where if you have an active department in a hospital, it wants to train young doctors to be those sorts of specialists because you get kudos for training young doctors, and it's really quite enjoyable teaching. So the training positions in, Australia, in Adelaide hospitals are based on the traditional specialties that already <coughs> exist and the training desires of the people who already exist there. With no reflection of what the population needs might be and what sorts of doctors we might actually require in our population. So we need to actually turn that completely on its head, look at our population, look at our health needs and say, what sort of doctors do we actually need and let's train some of them. So that's one of our changes. We obviously need to um, be working as an integrated system and we need to be training our healthcare professionals to work better together but also to be leaders. We're not, we, we haven't traditionally trained any of our clinicians to lead. We've expected that because we train them to be expert clinicians that would automatically give them leadership skills. I think everyone is born with a certain level of leadership skill, but you can, of course, like any other skill you have, develop it. And if you don't, you get left behind. And this is something that we need to um, be improving in our system. So we need more opportunities to work across different settings. We need a uh, better working environment. We need people to be fed back on their competence. And we need to actually 
hold people to better account than we've ever done. As you may know, in this system, you can be as badly behaved as you like because basically no one will, will hold you to account except yourself, which is, which is a bit tragic, and we need, to, we need to fix that. And we need to encourage innovation through continuous quality focus. We need to be educating our um, workforce better, and we need to change the way we train in order to reflect the new reality for our patients. And this is one of the big tensions of the junior staff. They're frightened that transforming health will alter their training. They shouldn't be frightened. Transforming health should alter their training, but their training should alter because of the changing needs of the health system, and we should embrace that. If we still trained the way we trained when I was a medical student, we would still be doing vagotomies and oversos for peptic ulcers instead of popping down to the chemist and buying some tablets. And we would still be seeing thousands of people with really ghastly deformed rheumatoid hands instead of not seeing those people because they're treated early with disease modifying agents. So medicine changes whether we like it or not. What we're doing is embracing those changes and making sure that we adjust our, our training and research to do that. So a huge amount of opportunity to um, change what we do and to support uh, education and research and leadership training and we need to basically sort of improve all of that. Data and reporting is another opportunity with the electronic patient administration system to be able to get real-time data and analyse real-time data, model what we're doing and predict what the changes will do and then evaluate whether the changes do do that. So enormous opportunities for research across transforming health. And I am really reassured that, that with everyone being interested and engaged in transforming health, that we will be able to do this. So, oh, there we are. I won't, go through, I won't go through the last slide. You've heard me say it all already. Okay, so what I'd like to do in closing is then to just welcome you all to the Transforming Health team. Everyone's a member and everyone uh, is welcome to put forward their ideas and to uh, join in. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dorothy. Now, Dorothy's going to be here for the whole afternoon. I think she just has to duck out for a short meeting, um, and then she'll come back on the podium later at, at the end of the session to bring it all together. So, um, obviously, as Dorothy said, this is a really exciting day, so stay tuned. We'll move right along.